Chapter 15 On the twelfth we made sail from Christmas Harbor, retracing our way to the westward, and leaving Marion's Island, one of the Crozet's group on the larboard. We afterward passed Prince Edward's Island, leaving it also on our left, then steering more to the northward, made in fifteen days the islands of Tristan de Acuna, and latitude thirty-seven degrees eight south, longitude twelve degrees eight west. This group, now so well known, in which consists of three circular islands, was first discovered by the Portuguese, and was visited afterward by the Dutch in 1643, and by the French in 1767. The three islands together form a triangle, and are distant from each other about ten miles, there being fine open passages between. The land in all of them is very high, especially in Tristan de Acuna, properly so called. This is the largest of the group, being fifteen miles in circumference, and so elevated that it can be seen in clear weather at the distance of eighty or ninety miles. A part of the land toward the north rises more than a thousand feet perpendicularly from the sea. A table land at this height extends back nearly to the center of the island, and from this table land rises a lofty cone like that of the Tina Riffel. The lower half of this cone is clothed with trees of good size, but the upper region is barren rock, usually hidden among the clouds, and covered with snow during the greater part of the year. There are no shoals or other dangers about the island, the shores being remarkably bold and the water deep. On the northwestern coast is a bay, with a beach of black sand where a landing with boats can be easily effected, provided there be a southerly wind. Plenty of excellent water may here be readily procured. Also cod and other fish may be taken with hook and line. The next island in point of size, and the most westwardly of the group, is that called the Inaccessible. Its precise situation is 37 degrees, 17 south latitude, longitude 12, degrees 24 west. It is seven or eight miles in circumference, and on all sides presents a forbidding and precipitous aspect. Its top is perfectly flat, and the whole region is sterile, nothing growing upon it except a few stunted shrubs. Nightingale Island, the smallest and most southerly, is in latitude 37 degrees 26 south, longitude 12 degrees 12 west. Off its southern extremity is a high ledge of rocky islets, a few also of a similar appearance are seen to the northeast. The ground is irregular and sterile, and a deep valley partially separates it. The shores of these islands abound in the proper season, with sea lions, sea elephants, the hare and fur seal, together with a great variety of oceanic birds. Wells are also plenty in their vicinity. Owing to the ease with which these various animals were here formerly taken, the group has been much visited since its discovery. The Dutch and French frequented it at a very early period. In 1790, Captain Pattern of the ship industry of Philadelphia made Tristan de Acuna, where he remained seven months, from August 1790 to April 1791, for the purpose of collecting seal skins. In this time he gathered no less than 5,600, and says that he would have had no difficulty in loading a large ship with oil in three weeks. Upon his arrival he found no quadrupeds, with the exception of a few wild goats. The island now abounds with all our most valuable domestic animals, which have been introduced by subsequent navigators. I believe it was not long after Captain Pattern's visit that Captain Colquhoun of the American brig Betsy touched at the largest of the islands for the purpose of refreshment. He planted onions, potatoes, cabbages, and a great many other vegetables, an abundance of all which is now to be met with. In 1811, a Captain Haywood of the Nerysses visited Tristan. He found there three Americans who were residing upon the island to prepare seal skins and oil. One of these men was named Jonathan Lambert, and he called himself the sovereign of the country. He had cleared and cultivated about sixty acres of land, and turned his attention to raising the coffee plant and sugar cane, with which he had been furnished by the American minister at Rio de Janeiro. 
This settlement, however, was finally abandoned, and in 1817 the islands were taken possession of by the British government, who sent a detachment for that purposes at the Cape of Good Hope. They did not, however, retain them long, but upon the evacuation of the country as a British possession, two or three English families took up their residence there independently of the government. On the 25th of March, 1824, the Berwick Captain Jeffrey, from London to Van Diemen's Land, arrived at the place, where they found an Englishman of the name of Glass, formerly a corporal in the British artillery. He claimed to be supreme governor of the islands, and had under his control twenty-one men and three women. He gave a very favorable account of the solubility of the climate, and of the productiveness of the soil. The population occupied themselves chiefly in collecting seal skins and seal elephant oil, with which they traded to the Cape of Good Hope, glass owning a small schooner. At the period of our arrival, the governor was still a resident, but his little community had multiplied, there being fifty-six persons upon Tristan. Besides a smaller settlement of seven on Nightingale Island, we had no difficulty in procuring almost every kind of refreshment which we required. Sheep, hogs, bollocks, rabbits, poultry, goats, fish in great variety, and vegetables were abundant. Having come to anchor close in with the large island, in eighteen fathoms, we took all we wanted on board very conveniently. Captain Guy also purchased of glass five hundred sealskins and some ivory. We remained here a week, during which the prevailing winds were from the northward and westward, and the weather somewhat hazy. On the 5th of November we made sail to the southward and westward, with the intention of having a thorough search for a group of islands called the Auroras, respecting whose existence a great deal of diversity of opinion has existed. These islands are said to have been discovered as early as 1762, by the commander of the ship Aurora. In 1790, Captain Manuel D. Oyevido and the ship Princess, belonging to the Royal Philippine Company, sailed, as he asserts, directly among them. In 1794, the Spanish corvette Atrevidia went with the determination of ascertaining their precise situation, and in a paper published by the Royal Hydrographical Society of Madrid in the year 1809, the following language is used respecting this expedition. The corvette Atrevidia practiced in their immediate vicinity from the 21st to the 27th of January. All the necessary observations, and measured by chronometers the difference of longitude between these islands and the port of Soledad and the Manilas. The islands are three. They are very nearly in the same meridian. The center one is rather low, and the other two may be seen at nine leagues' distance. The observations made on board the Antrevidia give the following results as the precise situation of each island. The most northern is in latitude 52 degrees, 37, 24 south. Longitude 47 degrees, 43, 15 west. The middle one in latitude 53 degrees, 2, 40 south. Longitude 47 degrees, 55, 15 west. And the most southern in latitude 53 degrees, 15, 22 south. Longitude 47 degrees, 57, 15 west. On the 27th of January, 1820, Captain James Weedle of the British Navy sailed from Staten Land also in search of the Auroras. He reports that, having made the most diligent search and passed not only immediately over the spots indicated by the commander of the Atrevidia, but in every direction throughout the vicinity of these spots, he could discover no indication of land. These conflicting statements have induced other navigators to look out for the islands, and, strange to say, while some have sailed through every inch of sea where they are supposed to lie without finding them, there have been not a few who declare positively that they have seen them, and even been close in with their shores. It was Captain Guy's intention to make every exertion within his power to settle the question so oddly in dispute. We kept on our course between the south and west, with variable weather until the twentieth of the month, when we found ourselves on the debated ground, being in latitude 53 degrees 15 south, longitude 47 degrees 58 west. 
That is to say, very nearly upon the spot indicated is the situation of the most southern of the group. Not perceiving any sign of land, we continued to the westward of the parallel of 53 degrees south, as far as the meridian of 50 degrees west. We then stood to the north as far as the parallel of 52 degrees south, when we turned to the eastward and kept our parallel by double latitudes, morning and evening, and meridian altitudes of the planets and moon. Having thus gone eastwardly to the meridian of the western coast of Georgia, we kept that meridian until we were in the latitude from which we set out. We then took diagonal courses throughout the entire extent of sea circumscribed, keeping a lookout constantly at the masthead, and repeating our examination with the greatest care for a period of three weeks, during which the weather was remarkably pleasant and fair, with no haze whatsoever. Of course we were thoroughly satisfied that, whatever islands might have existed in this vicinity at any former period, no vestige of them remained at the present day. Since my return home, I find that the same ground was traced over with equal care in 1822 by Captain Johnson of the American schooner Henry and by Captain Morell in the American schooner Wasp, in both cases with the same result as our own.